Welcome to episode 193 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how's it going today? I'm all right. How are you doing, Rob? Uh, I've had better days. Uh, we're, we're getting hit by some pollen here, and I'm adjusting to it. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's... Yeah, and also, I mean, spring spring is, is springing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we went from, like, you know, low 50s yesterday to upper 60s today. I think it's finally going to stay this way, though. Yeah, we've gone back and forth between blizzard, sunny, snow, sunny. Today's going to be cool. Tomorrow's going to be hot again. Well, hot by the standards of the time right like 68 or something yeah i think that's what we're at today but hopefully uh we'll we'll start maintaining it here in north carolina right yeah okay uh at every episode i'd like to read a piece of feedback uh this week we got a tweet from aditya srikumar hopefully i'm pronouncing that right probably not Uh, probably not um (laughs) and, and they're saying uh why do so few ides have easy support for building and debugging within a docker container VS Code was the best option so far, uh, considering C-Line and Eclipse as alternatives. And they're saying CVBcast would be great to get other perspectives. Um, I had heard about VS Code being good for Docker debugging because I saw this blog on the Visual C++ blog a couple weeks ago where mm. I think it was Mark Goodner uh, went through how to set it up to debug onto a Docker container. But I don't know about any other IDs and, and you know, good support for Docker. Do you, Jason? No, I've never even considered it. Like, the thought of needing to debug and Docker has literally never crossed my mind. Okay. (laughs) Well, if you're listening to this and you have, uh, you know, had a good setup with Docker and uh, any, you know, C++ IDE, feel free to tweet at us or send us a message so we can uh, get this listener some help. Yeah, I mean, it gives me flashbacks of having to do debugging on remote embedded devices. It's probably the same set of problems really yeah i don't think so Hmm. okay well we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or emails at feedback at cbcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes joining us today is marcus tillmans and tobias lensing marcus is currently the main software developer of bowden he has a strong background in c++ graphics and ui development he worked with cute for many more than 10 years on audio software and embedded projects and tobias is currently working as a software developer and product manager on bowden he's passionate about startups and entrepreneurship tobias has a background as cto in audio software cloud technology and web development guys welcome to the show thanks for having us yeah thanks (laughs) Wow. Uh, so you spent 10 years working with Qt, not working on Qt. Is that correct? That, that's correct, yes. I am definitely going to ask more questions about that later when we're talking about <laughs> Bowdoin. <laughs> Please feel free. And uh, just so we, our, our listeners know who's speaking, uh, can you both like say your own names? You know? I'm Toby. <laughs> and I'm Marcus. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking more about Bowdoin. Okay? Great. Okay, so first, uh, obviously, I talked a lot about this uh, two episodes ago when I was out in Redmond talking to the Visual C++ team, but Visual Studio 2019 uh, officially went live yesterday on April 2nd. You can now go and download it and you know check out all... The new features, and there are, are several new things for C++ developers, which is great. I find this interesting that the R's article mm-hmm. says, you know, with this world of rolling releases, why do they even bother giving it a new version number? It does make you wonder, like, is there going to be a day where they just have it, like, be, you know, Visual Studio X or something like that, and it just becomes the Visual Studio for the rest of the time that they just continually update? I yeah. I, I I I get it from because I do a lot of training at like at companies, right? Mm-hmm. And companies they they look for a number, right? While we need right. to spend the effort to upgrade to this new thing now. Yeah. And I don't know this. I feel like that could swing either way. Like my gut would be that most companies, if if from here on out, Microsoft never gave a new version number, they just patched it. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, well, we can't move past 2017 because 2019 is just too unstable for us. Or something like that. 
Right, and I guess it's, it's worth mentioning, Microsoft has done that model themselves with Windows 10. I mean, they're saying Windows 10 is going to be it forever, and they're just going to keep updating it. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing worth pointing out is um, they did this with Visual Studio 2017, where if you wanted to upgrade but for some reason couldn't update your compiler, then you could switch to 2017 and still use the 2015 C++ compiler. So yes. I did that again. So if you're using want to upgrade to 2019, but still need either the 15 or 17 compiler, you can do so. Um, I don't know how long they'll keep that going before they introduce a breaking change and need you know someone to actually upgrade and use the new compiler in order to use the new IDE. I don't know. No idea. Yeah. Are you guys uh, Visual Studio users? Well, we have to <laughs> sometimes, but not not really. I used Visual Studio a lot, but that's that's a long time ago. And I guess uh, for for Bowden, yes, we we use it. Um, but at the moment, we are only focusing on on Android and iOS, so that that's not really a Visual Studio job. So um, no, currently not really you. Um, me neither. Um, in, in my previous work. Um we had people working with Visual Studio. We already did cross-platform back then on, on Mac and Windows and, and embedded stuff. Um, but we've, like I would say, most of our people switched away from, from Visual Studio at some point. Yeah, and we, I remember in the, in the, in the beginning of Bowden, we tried a lot and, and had a lot of issues with different compiler bugs with, uh, and moving from uh, uh, Visual C++ uh, 2015 to 17 was rework. We had to change a lot of things. Um, I guess at the moment we are quite of enjoying that we can work with Clang across platforms yeah. because we don't have to take care of so many uh, different details. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I, but I guess that's the reason why they are supporting um, the old compiler in the new version. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so earlier this week it was April Fool's Day. Uh, I wasn't was. paying too much attention to April Fool's, but we do have one article here uh, that was an April Fool's joke. Uh, C++ 23 full pointer to replace null pointer. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not fall for this one, but it sounds like some of the people in the comments did, though. Yeah, I, I must. I, I must admit, I, I fell for it like halfway <laughs> through the article, and then I was like, "No, this cannot be true." <laughs> I, I like the, the the Reddit comment saying that uh, some guy was saying that he was missing ha a, a stit half pointer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> for sixteen bits uh, use cases. <laughs> yeah. I um, I didn't fall for it because I just I didn't. I didn't expect anything to be true on April first, basically. So mm -hmm. everything I read, I assumed was a made-up story, even the like serious stuff going on. But uh, there's actually like I'm reading this, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, I think there is almost an argument for this, and that is the embedded users who complain that zero is a valid memory address on some devices. Oh, okay. That's but true. on the other hand, like actually using this would be like impossible. <laughs> How would you ever check for null, really, right? Or check right. for an invalid pointer? Yeah. I like all the uh, fake quotes from everyone about how great full pointer is going to be. Yeah. So I assume this was intentional. But the first one is quoting Bjarne Strustrup. That is not Bjarne. That's not an older picture of Bjarne? I, oh, I was no. I confused about that. Okay. That is definitely not. I, I looked, I actually looked at the file name to see who it was. That's James Goslin. Okay. Uh, Goslin. That is, that is the creator. Who's, he was involved in what, Java? Am I getting that right? Oh, that's pretty funny. I'm going to get in trouble okay. real bad, aren't I? James Gosling. Who is, who is James Gosling? Come on, someone. Uh, I basically don't yeah. know. <laughs> Designer behind the Java programming language. Beyond or, Java. Okay, good. Phew. I don't lose my funny. geek card on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so that part was not an April joke, probably. <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> uh, were there any other particularly good April Fool's jokes that either of you saw the other day? I, I wasn't paying too much attention to anything. 
Yeah, I did I, see that Microsoft made some decision to not allow any like company level April Fool's jokes. I wonder if other mm. tech companies might follow suit in future years. My my favorite April Fool's joke was actually um uh, uh, a tech video where they showed how to um, liquid cool your PC with cement. <laughs> <laughs> and they made it look like it actually worked, but of course, it was a fool's. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of awesome. But, and then um, I'm like, well, I mean, concrete is, is, I don't know, what would that actually do? It seems like it would, it would run for a few minutes, right? <laughs> Like, Supposedly, it's had, it has very good heat capacity and stuff like that. So. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Hmm. I'll have to try that. I'll dump some concrete in my case after this. <laughs> sure. My brand new Ryzen build. <laughs> okay. And then the the last article we have is a update to Conan, and this also actually came out on April Fools. But as far as I can tell, there's no April Fools jokes. Uh, within this uh, release notes article. Um, it looks like the big change they made with Conan 114 is revisions. You can now uh, set uh, revisions when you're uploading a new recipe. Yeah, that could be handy. Yeah. Are you still using Conan a lot, Jason? I spent a lot of time with it in the last couple of weeks, actually, for a client. Um some of these things I find, like the C make find package multi, I'm like have read it a couple times now, and I still don't see how it really differs from what we are already doing with multi generators for Visual Studio. But I'm gonna have to spend some time with that and figure that out. That might be helpful to us, and I'm definitely interested in some of these things. But I'm totally a newbie at actually like creating and deploying my own packages. Right. Okay. Are you? Deploying like TypeScript using Conan or anything like that? No, no, no. This is all. Uh, well, well. I, I, I guess there's no harm in saying it's for custom Ruby builds that are needed for an embedded Ruby in the project that I'm working on. That's open, open source. Interesting. Um, okay. Which, for everyone listening, never embed Ruby in your C++ <laughs> project. <laughs> this has been like ten years of pain on this project, and I'm not exaggerating. It is, it's, it's never straightforward, and particularly if you need to support multiple platforms and multiple compilers. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> it's not designed <laughs> for it. Use Sol2, talk to the PhD, something, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Marcus and Tobias, do you want to tell us about the Bowdoin cross-platform framework? We, we talked about it. I guess late last year in a news article when we, we yeah, saw something yeah. about it, but uh, you know, why don't you uh, tell listeners more about it? Yeah, so um, Boden is, is our uh, framework project. Um, we've been uh, developing it at, at, uh, on it for quite some time now, and it's, it's aiming to be an application framework, and right now it's specifically for mobile applications on iOS and Android to allow you to write C++ applications and compile them both for iOS and Android. Is it a project that you are working on full-time? Yes. Yeah, okay. it's a full-time project and it's, um, it's, it's funded by the company we work for. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So the company you work for, are you like already making production level iOS and Android apps using Bowdoin or are you just working on the framework? Not yet. The, the framework is not um, advanced enough right now to really um, get a production ready iOS and Android app out there, but I guess we aren't, we are pretty near. It's, yeah. it's not, uh, we will definitely be, uh, be there in, in 2019. So, um, it's it's quite advanced, but it's not uh, it's not readily usable. To um, all the deployment stuff basically is missing, and we are working on a lot of details still. But um, one of the first projects internally is to get one of the apps that the company needs built with Bone. Yes. Okay, so I guess I mean you've kind of already said this, but let's just clarify what platforms are supported at the moment. Currently, Android and iOS only. Okay. Um, do you have minimum versions required for those platforms? 
Yeah, with um, with iOS, we're we're right now just targeting 12.x. Okay. And um, with Android, it's the last one that they released. Um, I can't remember the name. Like version 28 was. Um. Okay. So Android and iOS, and um, are you restricted to developing on a Mac? Because I believe that's a requirement when making an iOS application. Is that right? For iOS, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> For iOS, you are restricted uh, to Mac right now, and for Android, you can use uh, Mac, Linux, or Windows. Yeah, but at the moment, it, it's basically just for debugging and testing. You you can it's perfectly fine and possible to just um, develop on Windows or Linux uh, using Android Studio, or um, even Qt Creator, um, and then just do the um, compile, test, debug step on on on, an, on a Mac. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm still waiting for the day when I can compile and deploy my iOS app on Windows or Linux. Yeah. I don't care. Nice. It's just yeah. not Mac OS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and I guess that's one of the biggest challenges we are facing because it, it would actually be pretty nice to make it as easy as possible for developers to just do that because it's a, a constant hassle. Um, you have to have all those devices, you have to have the time to build it, and uh, it's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about what is different about Bowdoin compared to some of the other cross-platform frameworks. So my understanding is, you know, this isn't necessarily aimed at, like, a game developer. It's aimed at someone making, you know, apps, no, you know, not games, but apps where you would have, like, buttons and text boxes and lists and that sort of thing, and you're using, like, the actual platform user controls as opposed to, like, making your own the way Qt does. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, we are... Um, our goal is to to give you the, the native look and feel of, of an iOS or Android app cross-platform, so to speak, so that um, if, if you write an app once, on iOS, it behaves like an iOS app is supposed to behave, and on Android, it's, it behaves it as it's supposed to be on an Android device. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's kind of like React Native without the JavaScript part. That is, as okay. a, I think that's a good comparison. Yep. Yeah. Or like Xamarin Forms, which is a C sharp, right? Yeah. Yeah, those Xamarin probably draws its own stuff. I'm not sure. Oh, right. Right. It, I, I guess it used. can do native widgets. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. I think it can do native widgets. Yep. It doesn't do it everywhere, but it can do it. Yep. And I mean, compared to all other frameworks out there, basically, that are in, in use these days, except for Qt, of course, would be the, the focus on C++. Right. Uh, I find your decision to use the native widgets fascinating since you have 10 years of experience with Qt and that's <laughs> one of the distinct things that they don't do is use native widgets. Yep. Yeah, and um, I mean, you, you see it all the time. Um, a new version of, of macOS comes out and, and um, you have to wait and hope for, for a new version of Qt until their rendering methods have caught up with whatever theme changes macOS um, has, has in, implemented. And that's the awesome thing with with Bowden, um, you don't have to wait. And especially, th there are cases in, in Mulavit, for instance, where they switched to having the, the dark mode, where you had to recompile the application for it to, to be able to do dark mode, but that was all you had to do. You just recompile it once and you get all the new features of the operating system. And uh, you, you don't have to wait for us, so to speak, to, to re-implement them. And um, that, that gives us a tremendous edge um, when when it comes to to being being native, yeah, and also I think most of the frameworks trying to to render their own stuff, they they always fail at some level of detail. It's it's just a question of of how far into the detail you need to go. So, um, for example, especially on mobile devices, the feel of gestures and how it behaves and how it animates, that's, that's quite hard to match with uh, a non-native renderer. Okay. And a lot of work goes into that. Um, so that is also a reason why we decided to do that, because it's just um, a shorter time to life, I guess. It's, it's just easier for us to get um, a broad range of controls and everything finished um, in the framework 
um, before we have to even consider writing a renderer and writing input uh, protocols and everything that's needed. I mean, it gets it gets quite nasty if you go into text input and the details of that, and you you quite quickly reach that point. Right. Yeah. So rendering. we basically don't have to yeah. care about that. Yes. Yeah. You have to. I mean, it's not only rendering; it's also getting user input um, into the application, and that requires that you have all the 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 details ready for typing stuff on a virtual keyboard and so on, and that's that's quite quite nasty to implement if you don't use the, the native controls of the platform. So does uh, that limit you in some way because you're stuck to the what intersection of all the features between the Qt and, I said, sorry, not Qt, Android and iOS? Um, sure, we have to, the, 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 the flip side is that we have to make more sure that everything works the same on, on both platforms. I wouldn't necessarily li say limit. I, I think so far we haven't found a, an edge case that, that was only possible on Android or only possible on iOS. But it's definitely a little bit more more work and, and there has to be more t care taken to, to make it work the same on, on both platforms. Yeah, there was, there was one case where we... Um, we weren't we weren't sure sure about um, implementing lists and table views basically because that that is something that um, I guess React Native for example there it just stops being native it it as far as I know they just draw the um, the, the virtualization of the list and the handling of the list items and everything that's just basically custom code because that's easier to translate between between platforms. And we decided that we didn't want to do that, and actually we succeeded with it. So we were able to tweak the layout system that we use in a way that um, we can support native list controls on the platform. So on Android, it's really list view, <clears throat> and on on um, iOS, it's it's really the native UI table view that's being used to render list items, which are then again layouted by our custom layout system. So that, that was one of the major challenges, and that is, I think, a good example for your question, to answer your question, because yeah. that, that's pretty much the trouble you run into with that. So I, I'm curious uh, how this ultimately looks like. Are you having to call, I don't, I don't really know what the APIs look like, but I mean, are you having to talk to Objective-C++ on one side and Java on the other side, basically? Yeah, yes, exactly. Correct, correct, yeah. Okay. Do you have and, anything uh, that... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and we we have uh, we have uh, technology. We we build technology to make it easy for us to to wrap, uh, especially the Java side. Objective C isn't that hard because you can just call it from C plus um, plus. But we have a nice uh, library to to get the translation between J and I and and C plus plus done. Okay. What are, is it? One you've custom written? Well, it's it's basically we it's a, it's a thin. Uh, C++ uh, template layer based on, on top of JNI. That just oh, okay. makes it easy to say, let's say you want to call a function that, that takes a string, a Java string, and then we can just write an object that takes a std string and internally it automatically converts it into a JNI string and these kinds of things. Yeah, we are pretty much working on automating most of that stuff because it's just repeating work which is pretty pretty much the same always. Yep. So, but it's it, it, it's basically wrapping the Android API yep. in uh, C++, in a thin C++ wrapper, yes. All right. Okay. Are you creating the uh, user interface, like, at runtime or during the compilation process? Does it create, you know, the Java or iOS, iOS user interface? No, it's completely runtime. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just you just write the C++ code and everything else is, happens at runtime. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if you're planning to support any other devices outside of iOS and Android, any desktop or anything like that? Um, we, we definitely want to um, at some point, but right now we are, we are limiting ourselves to, to mobile to, to get that right. Um, but if you look into the sources, there is an unofficial Mac port already <laughs> that, that I like to use for, for development um, because it's a little bit easier. You don't, you don't have to have the simulator running and these kinds of things. Okay. And so, so we kind of, it's not, uh, it's, it's nowhere near as polished as the iOS and Android um, ports though. Yeah, yeah, and I guess one of, 
one of the next logical steps is to support Mac as we already have it more or less and uh, Windows Universal Platform. That would be or the next. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was. <laughs> oh, you're done. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say you could support Qt as your backend and then get all of the other operating systems. <laughs> That's not the first time we've heard about that. <laughs> yeah, you could basically do that. Yeah. <laughs> Technically, that's true, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that would um, be a nice uh, April Fool's show. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how complete is, is the API? I mean, I know there's a lot besides just user interface controls, like being able to get to the GPS or, or networking or, or things like that. Do you have that all mapped out into a cross-platform C++ API? Um, we have mapped it out in our planning. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, we, have a, we have a very simple, like an a XML HTTP request style um, network access already. Um, but uh, the whole um, sensors and, and cameras and so on and so forth, that's all planned for, for this year. Yeah, we will basically wrap all of the important stuff and um, make it available. But also we are trying to kind of come up with a good idea and it's work in progress, how we um, can enable developers to get a, a good path from uh, working in Android natively, having already having an app maybe, uh, or in iOS, and then transitioning to Bolton. Because that, that would basically eliminate most of the stuff that we don't um, provide at the moment, that then you wouldn't need it. You could just use Java natively or Objective-C or Swift or whatever you like and could just integrate Bowden into that app and then move step by step towards um, making an app basically cross-platform. And, and that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, one, one thing that's very important for us to us is um, to keep all the technology that we develop also accessible for the user in the end. Um, be that um, the build tools that we've that we've um, that we've uh, that we wrote for ourselves, we want to be able to to just have those. If if you just if if you don't like Bowden but but you you like the build tools, we, we want you to be able to use that. Or if, if you just if you if you're missing something, it should be super easy for you to um, to interface um, the the native platform yourself as well. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about this like native layout on devices and stuff and I know like today application development in general you have to be super flexible right like trying to do a rigid layout is a bad plan because you don't know if the phone's going to be what resolution what orientation all that kind of thing could be an and, iPad or tablet yeah, yeah. does um, Bowden either help with those things or does it cause a different set of problems for the developers like how does that layout come into play working with that so on the on the on the ground on, on the on the base layer um our widgets only have a position and a size um, okay. and um we have a completely free layout system um which means you can give any any control, any view, you can give whatever layout engine that you want. Um, so, uh, for instance, if, if you have some, some crazy idea how layout should work, you could just plug it in and all views could work with it. Um, and we, are, we totally agree that the flexibility is, is extremely important. And what we've done for now is um, to use the, the flex layout that, that you know from maybe some, from, from the web technologies. So basically, what you can do in a, on an HTML page with, with a flex layout, you, you can do in, in Borden as well. We're using the, the Yoga library from, from Facebook for that. Yeah, well, so it's it's basically, it's, it's very, very similar to writing flex layouts in CSS. Yep. So um, that, that is, I think, also helping a lot with uh, making it as flexible as possible because that allows you basically to just write uh, one layout style sheet and then um, have it work with uh, an iPad style app um, <clears throat> or a phone app, uh, be it a big phone or a small phone or whatever. 
um, it basically allows you to write kind of responsive layouts. Yep. So, and, and that was a, a quick way for us to solve this. Um, but I think it's important to stress that we allow to, to extend that in a very modularized way. So you can just plug another layout engine into it if you like and you can you can even mix them inside the same window it's a, nobody says that like all all views need to follow the same layout engine if you want you can you can mix and match them to your to, to your heart's content oh and the same is actually true for the ui itself so yes. what what draws the ui and whether it's a really native widget coming from the platform framework is actually also uh, modularized and replaceable. So you could just go and uh, put a renderer into it at any level. You can draw parts of the uh, UI natively and then have a, a view that's just rendered by, by a custom renderer and all of those things. Wow. Um, so a, a while ago I talked about how I would like to make a, a CPP cast mobile app um, and I was thinking maybe I'll look into Cute Mobile. I don't think I ever really got around to it. Uh, do you think I could make this with Bowdoin? Not right now, but Not very right soon, now. I think so. <laughs> yeah, right now it's probably it's possible, but it depends on how much effort you will put into it. Uh, because it's it's at the moment there's just some parts missing in, in Bowdoin. For example, I guess it would be pretty hard with the um, API that we provide at the moment to, to play back a podcast audio clip. Okay. Right. It's just uh, things that are missing because we just prioritize them down. There are specific use cases. We just, at the moment, we are quite focused at um, getting the most popular features um, out there. So, for example, video and images and all of this stuff. But once that support is in, I think it would be pretty simple. And another big thing that's probably preventing you from writing an app at the moment, which you would like to uh, get out to the people, is that we don't have a working solution for theming and styling. Mm. So um, that that is also um, maybe I wouldn't call it a disadvantage of the native of the native widget approach, but but it is definitely uh, a thing we need to solve. Um, you just have the native widget as it appears. Um, as defined by the platform, basically. So um, we have to come up with some way to make it uh, customizable and to to make, I don't know, like a button background color, a font that you want to set and all those things. That is what's right. basically preventing you to write that CPP cast app right now. So but if, if you're, you're like, like Facebook <laughs> and you want to have a certain theme to your apps that they look kind of similar on both the Android and iOS, then you wouldn't be able to do that yet, you're saying? Correct. Not no. yet, yes. Not yet. But it's definitely a pretty pretty big item on the list, and it will yep. come pretty soon. Because we, we think it's basically a necessity. Without yes. it, you, you probably won't be able to write apps that conform to the state of the art. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. A project that I've been involved in uses Qt, but by the time it reached a certain point of development, basically all of the widgets were just custom anyhow to get the exact look and feel that they wanted everywhere. Yeah, and then we definitely we, we definitely recognize the, the two different use cases where where you have a simple app that's totally that that that's actually better if it's just a native theme. Right. And, and then there's the, the opposite side of the spectrum where you want to completely theme it and we want to um, support both in the end. Yeah, finally, probably both solutions will be supported, yeah. even even a custom renderer, but we that, that's far in the future. Yep. And I, I think for now, it, you can get, I think most of the apps that you would want to do today, you can get done with the native APIs pretty much. Yep. That should be possible, even with fancy animations and stuff. So right now, uh, I guess the project's in kind of a beta stage, and you can just go to GitHub and download it and then go ahead and make your own application. Um, what are the future plans for it? Is this going to be, is it going to remain open source, or is it going to be some type of enterprise licensing? It will definitely remain open source. And um, we started off with the GPL, which was kind of a safe haven. <laughs> mm. 
um, because we, we didn't want to risk anything with licensing. Um, to be honest, Boden is uh, a project which needs to be funded if it, if it shall continue as it, as it is being developed right now. So we need to uh, find a solution to also monetize the project. That's just how it is. Um, but we will, I think it's, it's fair to say, we, we will switch to the LGPL. Um, license, so it will be kind of the same open source model um, as you can find with with Qt right now. Right. Um, and that will the biggest problem with the GPL was that people weren't basically able to to write an app and um, deploy it to the to the iOS App Store because then they would have to license their app under the GPL, and that would basically be rejected by Apple because it doesn't conform to the App Store terms of service. So. Um, that's Wait, you're funny... not allowed. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's a funny thing. <laughs> you're not allowed to release a GPL application to the App Store. That's that's correct. Yeah. How does that? What? Why? Why would Apple not allow that? <laughs> because it's basically the the, the um, yeah. I, I I'll try to to make it short and sweet. It's really a complicated um, legal thing. Um, but, but in the end, it boils down to um, Apple has terms in its um, App Store, iOS App Store terms of service, yeah. which basically prevent you from um, redeploying the app um, to anyone without using the iOS App Store. And that is forbidden oh. by, the, by the GPL. So, so if some well, other developer could go pull your code and then build it themselves and put it on their phone. That That's is what they is want to provide. Yeah. Okay. And that is not possible without using the services provided by Apple. So that is what what basically makes those two things completely incompatible. Okay. That is not the case with the LGPL. So basically, our interest was to be still be able. Um, to monetize the code. We have thought about many business models, but in the end it boils down to we need to be able to, uh, to sell the code kind of like the QT company does it. So um, you will have the option of um, licensing it under the LGPL um, in, in an open source project that can be a commercial project in theory but it cannot be a proprietary project. And if you want to uh, license Borden in a proprietary project, you basically have to um, get into a commercial license degree uh, agreement with us, with us, which we don't have yet, but we are working on it. And this probably will be the model. Um, it's not 100% decided, but I guess that will probably be the model for now. Okay. Okay. So it will definitely stay open source in the sense that LGPL is open source. And you will still be able to, to license it under GPL, but that is uh, only for people, I guess, working later um, on as soon as we have desktop support, for example, that wouldn't make sense again. You could just create an, a GPL app based on Boden on desktop. But for mobile, it, it doesn't make any sense, unfortunately. Right. So, uh, I mean, this is backtracking a fair bit, I think, but I mean, we've mentioned Qt several times, but I was curious, besides Qt, if there's any other libraries that you looked at or compared to before deciding to start down what's ultimately going to be a, a fairly long road for you to get this fully completed. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, we, looked, we looked at all of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <laughs> really, no, literally no, 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 all no. of them. <laughs> we, had, we had very long, long days where, where we looked at all the pros and cons of, of the different frameworks out of out there, and and seeing um, if there is a is a niche, a market for 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 a C plus plus framework that um, that primarily draws with the native uh, operating system uh, components. Yeah, we we are aware that we are kind of competing with uh, big companies. I mean, there's Google Flutter, there's Facebook React Native, there is uh, Microsoft Xamarin, there is uh, uh, the Qt company. Uh, so, um, but basically it boils down to, um, can we provide something that is worth 
paying for in a sense and um, I guess we still think we can because it's um, I mean Qt for example is pretty old it, it has a really big code base um, just the, the the simple act of installing Qt on your system is really really uh, not a good experience in my point of view and um, the other frameworks like Flutter and React Native, they are basically, we cannot compete with them. They are MIT licensed and they have a completely different business model. They don't make, need to make money. Right. So right. Um, what we are focusing on is basically mainly making something that is really usable and where you can, which you can use to save time and hassle um, at the moment if you are a C++ developer. We are also thinking about opening that up to other languages as well because, um, I mean, C++ is basically the foundation of everything and we are focusing completely on C++ right now. But I could imagine that in the future we are considering to, to support other languages as well. Um, so there's really a broad range of options I think we have to where we could also kind of pivot if something turns out to be not working. Right. We haven't gotten too technical. Um, like, what versions of C++ are you able to support with Bowden? Are you using C++ 17? Yes. Okay. And that, that's that's an important point. Is um, we we are looking to the future when it comes to technology. So as I said before, we are supporting Android 28, and we are not super concerned with the older versions. We are we're supporting iOS 12 not super concerned with the older versions because we also have to realize that that um, like adoption will be a little ways out for most people for this framework and um, we, we see it as absolutely necessary to, to use the, the new stuff so to speak um, especially when it comes to C++. Um, C++ has grown so much in the last couple of years and um, it's it would be a shame to not take advantage of that. And there's basically no one really at the moment, there's no one really taking care of that. I, that's at least what I feel. So for JavaScript, I mean, you have this big community coming up with new stuff uh, every day, basically. Um, and there are so many new frameworks and things you can use and try out. And for C++, we now have this development that there are um, new versions of C++ coming out with new features. And um, basically, we are using frameworks that are 20 years old. So. That is kind of the gap that we see and where, where we also see a niche which, which we could maybe fill. Yep. Yeah, it uh, brings an interesting point that I've thought about a little bit lately. So right when C++11 was released or in like in 2010, 2011 timeframe, we saw a rash of libraries come out that were like something 11. And everyone like tacked 11 onto the name as they supported C++11. And now all of a sudden those libraries sound eight years out of date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're not calling it Bowden 17. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, but um, but sure. Um, yeah, but but um, also when when we look to the to to the future of of C plus plus, like um, I think we talked a little bit about uh, C plus plus modules, and um, uh, one thing that I personally very much look forward to is the whole introspection um, stuff that's supposedly coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, <well>. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and and uh, yeah, I think there's there's so much uh, live uh, and and awesome stuff left in C++ that's that's still to come, and uh, it's a shame that that um, a lot of the the, the good the, the big frameworks are yeah kind of kind of stuck in in the old ways just because that's where they came from. Yeah. Is there anything particularly interesting you're doing with Bowden that you don't think you could have done with like earlier versions of C++? Um, I mean, um, um, stood string view, for instance, um, stood regex, um, even though it's not super performant at the moment. But it's <laughs> there and it works. And it yeah. works, exactly. And I, I mean, maybe looking at, at it that way, um, the thing that you can do these days with C++ is um, you have a very good standard layer. So when I look, for instance, at stood shared pointer or something like that, which isn't super new, but it's um, it's in the standard now, and and it allows you to to do away with like how many ref pointers, ref, uh, ref um, 
uh, shared pointers have, have we written in our, our lifetimes as programmers and we just don't need that anymore. It's it's all there in the standard and it, it makes super sense to, to use it because then when you come to the framework, you exactly know what's going on. When you see the shared pointer, you know how it works. There's, there's nothing that you have to, to learn again. I mean, Qt system, for instance, um, with, with Q objects that, that have delete later and then you but you also have a queue shared pointer and all these kinds of, of things that you all have to learn and I think that's that's the, the awesome promise um, with the new C++ versions is that you have, have it all in the standard and you can rely on how it works. Yes, and so also I, I think, uh, sorry? I don't know, go ahead, finish the statement. Okay, yeah. I, I think a big part of the development in C++ is not really what you can technically do with it but I see it as a kind of a usability thing because you have like it's really much easier now to write certain constructs for example with with 11 lambdas and all the stuff and also we I think 15 years ago we would have had a hard time um, implementing something like Boden without um, getting into the QT mock for example again yeah, like in, in that scenario where you have to come up with a meta code generator or something to ease your life to make it readable in a way and especially UI code my experience is that uh, what, what you just said if we um, can get more introspection and um, reflection into the language then it would be a big leap forward for, for UI code because basically oh, that's yeah. one of the biggest yeah. the biggest challenges is that C++ is so static uh, at certain points that's really a problem for UI code because it gets ugly and um, I guess that, that, that's a big part of what we are trying to do. We are trying to make it beautiful in a way that it is maybe beauti beautiful, uh, beautifully possible to a JavaScript developer right now to write uh, a JSON uh, dictionary, um, but for a C++ developer it's, it might still be a hassle or it would have been a hassle uh, 10 years ago, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that introspection would help you a lot probably with your J and I glue layer, I'm thinking. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and also properties. Properties yeah. were a big, uh, are still a big topic. I think there is no good solution for C++ properties that can have bindings and are kind of dynamic like for example in objective c you have kvo for doing uh doing observations on on property values and stuff mm. um it's just not possible in c plus plus you you run into quite funny problems for example then then you you write some property which allows you to do bindings and everything and everything looks nice and then you cannot copy the object holding the property anymore because some function pointer points to the object that has gone missing or you have you even have uh, null references and all of this stuff, not null references, but bad references. Um, we have gone through all of that and there are a lot of points in C++ which, which are still lacking in a way for UI frameworks. Yeah. Right. But when we look at 10 years ago, it's, it's so much better these days. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today, guys. Um, definitely keep us in the loop when uh, Bowden is at kind of a later stage in his development and you think, uh, you know, we might be able to go and make our own app with it. Okay? <laughs> that would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming on.